all right, uh, who am I? Um, I'm a former uh, critical care physician at the Seattle Children's Hospital and a uh, neuroscientist. I uh, did uh, most of my early work on uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, for central nervous system uh, leukemia. So that's sort of very, you know, hard science kind of work. Um, and all that changed for me one day when I resuscitated a little girl uh, in Pocatello, Idaho. And uh, after she was successfully resuscitated, after being underwater for 20 minutes, mm. uh, she said to me uh, that, well, she described her entire resuscitation. And that was a time that I knew she was clinically dead. And we, of course, taped their eyes closed. Uh, you know, because we don't want, you know, dust and grit falling in their eyes. And yet she was able to describe everything that happened to her, uh, even chance conversations between me and the nurses. And then when she saw the look on my face, <laughs> as she's telling me about what happened, uh, she, she pats me on the wrist and says, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. And uh, that led me to uh, prospectively study uh, near-death experiences at Seattle Children's Hospital. Over a 15-year period, we interviewed every survivor of cardiac arrest and carefully compared them to appropriate controls so that we could see that um, you know, wasn't their experiences weren't from a lack of oxygen to the brain or the scary you know, being in an intensive care unit, intubated, uh, or the many medications uh, that we give these uh, patients, which can cause dissociation in theory. Uh, but our control patients, you know, they, they fit conventional neurology. Uh, they didn't uh, remember uh, anything of experiences. Of course... <laughs> As a medical student, I did work under the great uh, Dr. Vernon Moncastle, and I took care of a patient of his. He removed half of the patient's brain in an effort to control intractable seizures. And it was my job to then assess uh, you know, the patient's uh, neurological function. And he was very, uh, had very little uh, deficit even though he'd lost half of his brain in surgery. Um, he uh, still had his memories, uh, still had uh, his personality, sense of humor, walked with a slight limp. And I said to Dr. Moncastle, I said, <laughs> you know, what gives? You know, this isn't the way I was taught, uh, you know, in neurology, uh, that uh, the, how the brain... And he looked at me and he said, what the F do those neurologists know anyway? And I certainly learned that that was true in my studies of near-death experiences in children. Um, and so there, there can't be any doubt, uh, scientific evidence today, uh, that the process of dying involves actually an expansion of consciousness, not the cessation of consciousness, you know, as we're all taught uh, in school. Uh, but uh, typically these patients are comatose and then they actually wake up uh, at the point of death. A uh, little boy uh, once uh, then asked me about his near-death experience and he said to me, but was it real? Because if it was real, you have to tell all the old people. <laughs> and uh, I, at that point, I decided to see uh, whether or not uh, these experiences are real. Um, one of the first things I looked into was this issue that they enter into a world of all information. And I'm going to be very interested in talking uh, and hearing Dr. Uh, Van La Luiven. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. But um, Van Lama. Oh, thank you. Um, because uh, my understanding of uh, physics uh, is that uh, reality is actually uh, an electromagnetic field 
which is embedded with information and that this is an informational universe. Uh, so, and that's what children that visited it described. They said they knew everything. And they even described the process of losing all that knowledge when they returned to their brain, implying that the brain is you know, a filter. Um, and, you know, so this, uh, I think, uh, indicates that the brain is perhaps an antenna uh, embedded in this uh, informational universe. And that is um, widely discussed in the theoretical uh, physics literature for 30, 40 years now. So I learned to remote view uh, because after all, if we're capable of entering into the informational universe, then we should be able to retrieve that information. And sure enough, remote viewing is real. Um, and uh, that's been in the uh, scientific literature, oh, I think probably 40 years now. The thing that the children describe that, that is meeting dead relatives, uh, one little girl said to me, she, uh, this, she, you know, we had to put a needle in her heart to resuscitate her. So that's near death uh, by any definition. And uh, she said that she was awake when that happened. And she said she saw her grandmother who had just passed. And she said, I was just so shocked to see her. Um, and then she described herself as being back. And when I asked her, what does that mean? She said, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So, you know, this visiting uh, dead relatives uh, and the idea that um, individual consciousnesses persists uh, got me interested in mediumship. Now, before I talk about, uh, uh, you know, I applied for a Bigelow Challenge uh, to study mediumship. I think over 400 uh Various scientific groups applied. We were one of six uh, that won. Uh, so, but before I describe that, I just want to talk a little bit about this group that I'm so impressed with. Because one thing that really I learned is that the near death experience world, they don't talk to the remote viewers. And the remote viewers don't want to be associated with mediumship. And just recently, the near-death experience, uh, you know, IONS, uh, has sort of uh, started to work with mediums. But for many years, you know, you know, we, you know, we're not crazy, but those mediums, they're the crazy ones. And it's just so wonderful to see a group of people that that has, you know, obliterated those labels because those are all irrational labels. Um, model, you know, uh, the physicist, you know, I would love to have a conversation uh, with them. Uh, I'm more of a neuroscientist and just a physicist, you know, by self-education. But um, our model is that this is an informational universe and we're connected to the hardwiring of our brain specifically areas in our right temporal lobe that connect us with this universe. And if that's true, well then, I mean, a medium should be able to access the cluster of information that represents a human personality, uh, should be able to access, you know, any type of information. And remote viewing and medium are precisely the same. Uh, however, uh, the other reason I'm excited about this group is science does not accept evidence alone. You know, I know that uh, you know, Victor's website you know, talks about that the evidence for the afterlife would you know, prevail in a court of law. But not a scientific world. In the scientific world, they need a mechanism, a theory that explains it. 
And I mean, you can look at the history of science. Um, there was plenty of evidence in the 1800s that washing your hands, surgeons and obstetricians, if they wash their hands, there'd be less deaths uh, from disease. And that was ignored for 20, 30 years until finally the theory of germ, uh, you know, germ theory uh, and germs were actually seen under microscopes. Only then could science uh, change. And I think that that needs to be done uh, with uh, you know, the science of the afterlife. I can't wait to read that book uh, because that needs to be done. Because the truth is that materialism is dead. There's not even a theory of matter anymore. I mean, it, 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 there's not even a generally accepted definition of matter. Reality is now thought to consist of electrons and quarks, which are both, uh, you know, electromagnetic, uh, you know, energetic uh, forces. And uh, there is no science that indicates that the brain creates consciousness. There's no science that long-term memories in the brain. And yet that's what scientists believe simply because it's left over from the science of the 1800s. Um, the science has to do uh, with consciousness and consciousness uh, being one of the fundamental principles of the universe. One of the smartest scientists uh, in the world, Robert Lanza, proposed that 20, 30, 25 years ago. But unfortunately, these same scientists don't talk to mediums, don't talk to remote viewers. And so the, the theory doesn't match the clinical applications in, real, you know, in this reality. And that's got to change uh, before uh, any progress can be made. And that's what we attempted to do uh, with the Bigelow study. Alrighty, so what was our study that uh, we were funded uh, by Robert Bigelow? Uh, I, I think people know he's a Las Vegas uh, aerospace entrepreneur, billionaire, uh, well known for his work with the Skinwalker Ranch. And I was a uh, part of uh, that work with him. I've worked for him uh, off and on over last 30 years. Um, so, Mr. Bigelow had four questions that he uh, wanted to ask what he calls the other side. And I think that's probably a better term to use than to say the informational universe, uh, which, you know, I don't think resonates as, as uh, well. But I think it also illustrates one of the is that scientists are using different vocabulary than practitioners. You know, mediums are, are not speaking the same language as scientists, and the language itself then becomes a barrier between, uh, you know, those fields finally meshing as they should. Uh, uh, as, as an aside, uh, in our study, I work with two Harvard neuroscientists who advised us uh, on, you know, the planning of our study, both of them did not want their names associated in any way uh, with our research because they felt it would be detrimental uh, to their career. You know, and that's, that's what's got to change. Uh, you know, we, we, we just have to see that mediumship is the clinical application of other uh, physicists who talk about uh, consciousness as being a fundamental principle of reality. Anyway, so Mr. Brigolo had these four questions. And these are very common sense questions that I think everybody uh, has about the world today. Uh, he is very influenced by the work of Alan Kardec. I'm sure most of you are aware of his work scientist uh, in the 1800s uh, who developed spiritism and he uh, interviewed mediums and asked them similar questions 
and his method was to ask the same question of multiple uh, mediums and to see if he got the same answers. So that's what Mr. Bigelow wanted us to do. And we interviewed a total of uh, 19 uh, mediums. His questions were, question basically is, since the time of Alan Kardec, what's happening with humanity? Has humanity failed in its spiritual progress? And if so, does that mean that the spirit world has let down humanity? You know, are bad humans and bad spirits winning if we're failing in our spiritual progress? And I think, you know, it's obvious why I ask such a question with the horrors of Gaza and the uh, divisiveness uh, that goes on in the United States today and really uh, worldwide. We're seeing this kind of uh, hostility and anger uh, in, in, you know, the public domain. So that was his first question. Um, I mean... I know that you know many people. I know I know Gary. You know we work with uh, uh, August go forth, and you know one of his concerns was, wait a minute, is that really the role of the spirit world? I mean, uh, you know, the, should we be actually challenging the spirit world? Hey, have you guys failed us? But that was the question, and uh, it uh, uh, is a reasonable one. A lot of people have that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why have we done everything right, and yet still terrible things are going on? His second question was, what has the spirit world done for us? And his third question was, what has the spirit world done for us lately, you know, since the time of Allan Kardec? And his fourth question was, are there saboteurs or earthbound spirits or bad humans sabotaging uh, mankind's spiritual progress? So these questions may seem naive. Uh, however, I, I do want to tell you uh, that one of the very first messages that we received from our mediums was that these questions were in fact inspired by the spirit world. And when you hear the answers, uh, you know, I think you'll see why. These are these are questions that ordinary people have, not spiritually, you know, elevated people, you know, not, not people that I think are common sense kind of questions. But I really didn't think that I could ask a medium these types of questions as stated. One of the problems I know from remote viewing is that when the information from the informational universe comes to us, it's filtered through our own brain and our own preconceptions. So let's say, for example, we're remote viewing the Eiffel Tower. And the information comes through, it's tall, uh, people are going up and down it. It's in a big city. It's a landmark. You know, this kind of information is coming in. And then suddenly, our own brain jumps in, because we're ego-bound. We want to be right. We go, aha, oh, it's the Seattle Space Needle. I got it right. You know, and then skeptics go, man, why does he think he can remote view? You know, he was remote viewing the Eiffel Tower. He thought it was a Space Needle. You know, obviously, there is no truth to remote viewing. Um, remote viewers get around that problem by targets as numbers. Numbers get rid of the internal me uh, mental noise. So we coded our questions as numbers. So I didn't ask the mediums. You know, we, we would ask them to contact their entity. Um, you know, telling them we had questions for them. And then we would just say, uh, you know, instead of uh, has been, uh, failed in its spiritual progress, instead we would say 897-284-325. And 
and waited for the answer. And I have to tell you, to our great astonishment, the mediums answered the questions. And there can be no doubt that they answered the questions uh, to the point. Uh, I'll give you an example. For the first question, you know, has the spirit world failed man uh, humanity? And, uh, you know, has mankind failed in its spiritual progress? Um, I uh, asked one of the mediums uh, to contact uh, one of her entities. And she contacted the voice, the all that is one. And then she said, I have questions for you, but I don't know what they are. I only know. And the entity said to her, don't worry. We do know the question. And it immediately said to her, you can't measure progress by success or failure. That's not the role of humanity. That you're here to learn lessons. And failure is part of that progress. So, I mean, you know, obviously that was pertinent uh, to the question. Um, so uh, we, we asked our 19 mediums that question. Um, I have to tell you... Uh, uh, I'll come back to the first question, but the second question was even more interesting to me. Um, uh, Mr. Bigelow asked us that we had to really, <laughs> I'm just telling you, um, we had to hold the spirit world's feet to the fire and ask them very specifically, how did, in fact, the spirit world help humanity? <laughs> I mean, I know. But come on, I mean, these they're our funding uh, agency, uh, and uh, this was our task, and uh, they uh, funded us, and uh, that our job is to uh, fulfill, um, you know, both our own purposes, uh, which is to fund the science of mediumship, and to answer their questions. So we uh, approached one of our mediums. Uh, this medium uh, works for the FBI, has worked for the FBI for 27 years as a psychic. So she's obviously the real deal um, if they've employed her for that long. Uh, they gave her permission uh, for me to tell you that they have successfully solved 154 uh, cold cases and brought closure to families uh, through her work. Um, so I gave her the question. Uh, you know, again, as a number. And she uh, she's a deeply religious uh, Roman Catholic. And, you know, just like the near-death experience, people have to get over the fact that one person sees heaven one way and another person sees heaven completely. And yet they're both having the same experience. You know, so we have one medium that's contacting, you know, the, the all that's one, and she's contacting the Trinity because she's a deeply religious Roman Catholic. That's how the spirit world communicates with her. So I gave her the number, and she said, uh, a woman is coming to me, and she wants to answer the question, and she's showing me tablets. She wants me to feel them. They're made of stone. They're curved on the top. They have numbers there's 10 numbers, and there's writing after each number, but I can't read the writing. And that rings true to me, because I know from remote viewing, um, interacting with the universe is a right brain skill, and the left brain is our language skill. And so by and large, remote viewers have a very difficult time uh, with language you know, things. Uh, they, you know, it's hard for them to read writing. Uh, so, the, you know, this, this made sense to me. But she clearly was being shown uh, the Ten Commandments. And this clearly was the uh, informational universe, the other stuff. Uh, rising to the challenge. We held them to the fire. We asked them for specific examples. 
And sure enough, they said, you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? <laughs> you know, you don't think that the uh, spirit world has tried to help humanity? Uh, you know, well, why don't you, uh, for the first, uh, our first piece of evidence, uh, we're going to show you uh, the Ten Commandments. And uh, I just, I thought it was very pertinent. Um, in fact, I came to believe that uh, our entire experience with our 19 mediums was actually one uh, lengthy conversation, uh, you know, presenting information uh, to humanity. Third question was, well, what have the spirit world done for us lately? Using our tech of numbers, again, gave a very robust answer to that question. Uh, for example, uh, one of our mediums is a high school graduate in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, she has no interest in chemistry, uh, you know, or any, you know, anything like that. Uh, she works for the VA as a claims processor. When I gave her the number of that question, she drew the bent ring. She said, I don't understand it, but I'm being shown this diagram, and she drew it for me. Um, the benzene ring was given uh, to uh, Kukule, who was a uh, German uh, chemist in the late 1800s. It was given to him in a spiritual vision. Uh, no way that uh, you know this uh, medium in Fort Wayne, Indiana knew that. Uh, and in fact, uh, she didn't even know what the question was. Uh, you know, so clearly this was a clean, clear communication uh, from the spirit world saying, sure, you want an example? Well, we gave uh, the benzene ring uh, to uh, Kukule in a vision. The benzene ring led to Germany's industrial might, uh, led directly to World War I, which... The medium was then told, uh, led directly to the League of Nations, the first uh, United Nation. And she was given a clear message that you have to stop worrying about war. You have to stop worrying about conflict. Those are all opportunities for spiritual development. The entire uh, purpose of, you know, of this segment of the answer was to say, sure, we inspired the benzene ring. We knew it would lead to Germany's industrial might. We knew it would lead to the conflict of World War I. And that was part of our spiritual uh, provocation, I guess is a good word, you know, our way of teaching uh, humanity. And... Uh, uh, you know, then our final question was about earthbound spirits. Um, and there was a very nice, uh, clear message there. It's humans. You know, humans are uh, to blame or at fault for their own lack of progress. But then they quickly said, it's not a lack or of progress. You know, we're parents watching children to walk. Of course, you're going to fall down again and again and again. Of course you are. And it's not our job to intervene. Um, you know, but, but the final, you know, that's why we titled our book, An Urgent Message, is and remember this came to us by presenting numbers to mediums. They said, you're now at the point where if you don't learn from each other, you may be at the point of self-extinction. And, you know, this world is an invented world. This is the spiritual reality. We're here to learn lessons of love. But if you burn this house down, you know, if you fall off a cliff, nobody's going to be learning uh, any lessons of love anymore. And, uh, you know, going back to the first question that we Again and again, that was the message that we got. We would give, for example, we would give the first question's number 
uh, to the mediums, and they would say things to like, uh, we're being shown uh, a scene from the movie Thelma and Louise, where Thelma and Louise drive their car off the edge of a cliff. And now I'm being told that's the price of freedom. You know, we give you free will. We give you these spiritual challenges. And yet, you know, you, you now have developed the ability for self-extinction. And that was uh, particularly sobering for, uh, for me because, uh, you know, we had no, you know, horse in the race. Uh, our job entirely was uh, to develop a scientific protocol uh, to present these questions to mediums. Uh, we were funded, uh, and it didn't matter to us what the answers were. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have a horse in the race. Uh, any answer that we got, we would have reported. Um, our main interest was developing our scientific protocol, developing standards for mediums. Our mediums had to show that they were a uh, remote view or uh, we accepted them into our study. They also had to show that they could influence the flow of electrons with their mind for at least 20 minutes out of a 30-minute session. Uh, this and other research has been shown uh, to correlate uh, with altered states of consciousness, meditation, remote viewing, Reiki healing, uh, etc. And then uh, we, uh, one of my... Uh, co-workers is uh, Dr. Guiona uh, from Spain. Uh, he's, I think, one of the world's experts in the idea of the brain as an antenna. And, you know, we proposed, you know, to me, one of the first comprehensive theories of exactly how mediumship and remote viewing. Because of what I started this talk off with, is evidence alone won't do it you know so we uh you know that's what we used uh our uh, research grant for and yet the message we got in response to these questions is something i think that all humans uh, need to know about what questions do you have wow <laughs> 